because you're not producing anything, but you still have all the people, air conditioning, gases, everything is going on. So he used to remind me. So now, what year was this, 486? So, 486 came out in for, uh, 1989. 386 uh, came out in 85, 86 time frame. Uh, compaction that I worked on came out in 87, 88. So, but by the time Pentium's turn came, and we were launching Pentium, not only people by and large were buying computers, the industry had suddenly recognized, by golly, there's a huge opportunity here. Sun Microsystem that used to build workstations and servers suddenly thought, hey, we can move a step down if you look at a pyramid and think servers and workstations at the high end, they said we can just shift the gear down and get into this stock. Um, Motorola, of course, was always there, except Motorola had become even a bigger fair because Motorola, Apple, and IBM formed, formed a consortium and they were going to build a chip based on power PC architecture that will negate the x86 existence and kill them. Three companies, I mean three powerful companies joining hands. It's not like, you know, we're not talking about three startups. But I think the single biggest threat, and then there was Digital Equipment Corporation, if you remember, tech. They were trying to get into PCs. They had an offer chip. Then our friends here, HP, lo and behold, they had a precision architecture. They wanted to get into Pentium. But the one that I sweated most was there was a consortium formed called ACE. Um, John Hennessy, who's the dean of uh, Stanford, or not the dean, he was the head of Stanford. He uh, and uh, Bill Gates and Compaq, again, three very powerful companies, got together to create an alternate architecture based on an architecture called RISC reduce instructions and computer. And they claimed it's uh, simpler, cheaper, better, faster, easier. And by the way, all of those claims were true. Regretfully, all of those claims were true. And we had to fight against that on Pentium. So I had the, the uh, honor of working on a project where I was told, don't F it up, make sure we get it there. And it's going to be make or break for this company. Because either forever, Intel will change because there is an alternate who has set up their foothold, or we will just clear everybody's plate. So it, it, there, there's a lot of pressure. Uh, now, this is a little told secret. What we computed internally was that our uh, architecture, it was called brain dead architecture, although we call it CISC, complex and successful computing. But there was people who were writing articles saying, Intel is a brain dead architecture. It's dead, it's over. The calculation we did was the risk could be maybe three, four times faster than us because it was inherently uh, a superior architecture. But the conclusion we came to was that if we could internally on the x86 maintain a 2x improvement, just a 2x, we will wipe all of them off. The reason is we concluded that the threshold of pain that all the software developers and the customers and the IT managers and the world at large will have and the consumers of shifting from an existing software base that had been used over and over from 286, 386, 486 to go to an entirely new architecture, no matter how superior it is, will not be worth it unless we make ourselves do it. And really, so the internal goal that I had was could we double the performance with the Pentium, and we did. And you left uh, very uh successful corporate job, and you took uh, the CEO of uh, Silicon Spice 
uh, and it was a very it was a very small startup. So, what were the challenges uh, that you faced uh, before joining, and whom did you consult, and who were your mentors at that time? And basically, uh, we would like to know more about the transition from a corporate job to an entrepreneurship. A lot of NITs have very good uh, corporate jobs. They have the urge because they are in Silicon Valley. They would like to test the waters on the entrepreneurship side. Yeah, so correction, I didn't go to Silicon Spice, I first went to Next Gen. And uh, I tell you how the transition took place. So I was a vice president at Intel, which by the way, I don't know today, but by at that time when Andy Go was running the show, you really had to prove yourself three times over in your life before he would give you that acknowledgement. Um, and once you are, then you're a corporate man. And I think that recognition came to me in context of, I was 45 years old. And I used to read about all these startups in the valley and excitement of startups and companies going public. And, and I told myself, either I step out now or one day I'll be in the easy chair, looking back and wondering what it would have been like had I stepped away. And if I stay with Intel, I'll be just going through the corporate man thing, which is, you know, you do as your boss tells you to, and you stay loyal, and you keep on getting promotion, even if you're a duffer. Uh, at least you'll get a couple more, if not good So I think I, I kind of, toyed with that, and being a uh, person from Indian origin, being conservative, growing up in a middle class family, knowing the value of money, uh, I recall, I didn't have any mentor, but I recall uh, having this discussion with my wife, because I had two kids, and I said, you know, if I step out, it could be a big fat zero, because you, you don't know, status work or not. <laughs> And I'm going to leave all this wonderful assets that I've created here at Intel, you know, on the table. So we actually went and visited a financial planner. And so it wasn't any mentors, but this was a team of us who looked at what I had already. And based on that, what our lifestyle for our rest of our life would be, and gave a clean bill of health to my wife and me to say, you can go ahead and take the risk. So, and I tell you, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I've said a few times in my life that the best thing that ever happened to me was to join Intel, and the next best thing that ever happened to me was to leave Intel. And I would have never discovered this underground world of startups. It's almost like you have no idea. You guys are a little bit more modern now, but back then, I mean, if you work in a corporation like Intel, I never had to worry about whether I will have plenty of money to complete Pentium program, for God's sake. They'll kill me, but they'll keep on throwing more money at it. You know, it's make or break for a corporation which is multi-billion dollars. They'll probably bring 10 other wins in there. Doesn't matter. But the survival of uh, learning to survive in a startup as an entrepreneur brings in you a dimension of humanity and profession and totality that is unthinkable. I would encourage each one of you, if you ever get an opportunity in your life, to just hang out there and experience it. It's like bungee jumping. It's like skydiving. It's like getting up every day and knowing that there are 1,001 reasons to fail. But I might need to find that one that will make me really sexy. And there are sleepless nights, which I didn't know until I went into startup. That, you know, I slept like a baby even though I was working on Pentiums and other things. It was more of a pressure, finishing a project. But a pressure of looking at 100 